Vertigum. We are here with Will Crane, stone sculptor, oil and watercolor painter, and skilled in drawing media as well. It was so tricky to shrink wrap your extensive and impressive curriculum vitae, um, which you can see online. We'll provide details with that later. You've been an artist since you were old enough to use crayons. Your work has been shown in juried sh shows and solo shows from Burbank, California to St. Augustine, Florida to Phoenix, Arizona, where you were artist in residence to Beverly Hills, California to Moscow, USSR, not Moscow, Montana. <laughs> Your work has won awards and accolades a lot. Um, you served as president of Billings Arts Association in 2006 to 2009. A little long time. <laughs> you opened and operated your own art gallery in Jackson, Wyoming. Since 1998, you've been a ghost sculptor on the larger than life size triple dolphin configuration, yeah. bronze fountain at the Long Beach Aquarium, California. Yeah and other sculptures around the USA. Um, there's so much more, but let's get to question, because that's the well, what is the role of art in your life? Ooh, that's, a, that's a leading question. Uh, it is, it's everything, it's the be all end all. It's what uh, is right now makes me realize Time is ticking away here, so I want to get as much done as I can. At this point, it's a rush to get all the drawing in, the carving in, the painting in. Uh, when I'm carving, I want to be painting. When I'm painting, I want to be carving. Uh, and I'm, I'm probably out there more than one. So, so there's a lot going on in the art world for me. I'm not complaining. It's good, but you know it's a challenge. Yeah. Balancing time. Uh, it's, um, you know, I have these ideas. You know, you want to get done, like like this little thing, I, the powder thing here. Yeah. I don't know what that is. A doodle, a didactic doodle. <laughs> No, that term has been used before. So. Paul Klee, you know, like Paul Clay. Oh yes. Oh yes. He did his didactic doodles. Oh. And, uh, so I'm gonna copy him and digitize him. Digitize didactic doodles. That sounds like something you would come up with. Will is quite the wordsmith and player with <laughs> words and ideas. Amazing brain. Uh, yeah, wordsmithing is fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, it's, we got quite the language. So uh, I'm like fascinated that. with this idea of legacy or leaving a watermark on culture or uh, or the world somehow. How do you see your work yeah, doing I, that? I feel extremely fortunate. It's going to be a long time before these stone carvings are melted. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, although I know that there's a black hole heading towards us. In outer space. It's not to inner space yet, it's still outer space. Okay. <laughs> but uh, I know my stone carvings are going to be around for a good long while. They're really hard to break. So that, that's a one up uh, as far as being having a name in the art world and from history. But there's so many artists. I don't know where that name would appear on a list. God, it could be at the bottom. But the legacy, it depends, I think, too, on the artist. If they really feel like, well, I've got to get some work in because time is ticking and I want to, I want to have a, a spot in the art world after I'm pushing up daisies. So it's a tough question. 
in my mind, legacy or watermark is not only about a, a name, but also things such as inspiration. You have undoubtedly inspired and motivated a lot of people throughout your career. Well, I felt that way last night for sure. That I really got the accolades last night. I, you know, I like what you're doing. You're really talented. Uh, can I borrow this? Yeah, so that, I was surprised. So I usually go and I sit in my spot, make sure that nobody goes out the back door with something they shouldn't. But yeah, a lot of people can talk. Talk to the hand. <laughs> um, it was really good to get that perspective. I really haven't had that perspective. Really? Yeah. Even after I mean, they were lined up time. last night. Here's a good question. In your fabulously sensuous, textural, often mythic sculptures, why do you enjoy finding what's in the stone, his words, rather than engineering your ideas with tiny gauge graph paper and calibers? In other words, what does creativity look like for you? Uh, it, it's a connection to uh, the original stone carvers and, and their uh, culture, if, if you could call it that. Uh, you know, they took a hammer, they, something, they probably found a, a bigger rock to pound on something that looked like a chisel. And, and what they carved, you know, was just a really interesting for me Enter, enter something or other. There aren't words for some of this stuff, I don't think, but um, I go to the past in my head, what's working now and what worked back then in, in the sense of forms. Um, so there's just about every piece that has some character that I pulled out of a foreign stone carving you know, it could be fishing, it could be, it could be done anything that, that I could throw, uh, well, like that piece there, you know, it's got things coming in and out of it, uh, certainly when you start using figures, they speak differently to different people, but for me, that what's inside that rock, I'm still in charge of. It's not telling me what to do. I'm telling it what to do, and it is so happy to do it. Now, we're talking Carrera Marble. There's nothing finer. It's, uh, it's just the be-all, end-all, because it takes a good polish. <laughs> That's not the only reason. But it doesn't have a grain. There's no grain in Carrera Marble. So you can carve up, down, sideways, in, out, and it's not going to break. It's not going to crack. And, and that is pretty nice. You know, it's like it's like a brush that doesn't wear out. I don't know if that's an analogy. But, uh, it's, a, it's a fabulous stone. I'm really lucky to have a ton of it. Uh, there's other marble. A marble Colorado. Uh, they have Colorado Yule. Colorado Yule is used in the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier and all kinds of cladding. You know what cladding is? Um, on the outside of something. Uh, no, I'm not yeah, sure. It could be inside too. Walls. But they, they have little squares that they glue up against the walls. Okay. And that would be cladding. Well, the, the marble that they use that from Marble, Colorado, is disintegrating. No, it's, it's, not, it's not Carrera. I don't think there's anything like Carrera. It's, uh, it has weaknesses in it, like like alabaster. You can't go put an alabaster stone carving out in the rain because it'll melt. You'd be better off grinding it up and putting it in a fire and making wallboard out of it. 
because that's what alabaster is, wallboard. Only it's just been cooked a little bit, or ground up and then cooked. Uh, and all this relates to Carrera because um, I'm just fortunate to have it. It's, it's just amazing. And, and that's probably a reason why there's not so many carvers out there. Why you don't find stone carvers left and right. Right. That's, um, I mean, it's a, a well-sanctioned art thing. You know, well, it, it's, it's history, but people aren't doing it because the commodity to carve in is limited. <coughs> and, and if you get something that's not Carrera, see, I think it's just a hammer and chisel. No power tools. <coughs> and you probably want to know why no power tools. Mm -hmm. uh, can you imagine the dust that would have created if you were using power tools? Mm. You have to wear a hazmat suit. Mm -hmm. And I'm not kidding, that's what they do if they have to do power tools. They grind it. Well, this stone is so nice, I don't want to grind on it. And alabaster is so soft, you don't need to grind on it either. So it's just not really propitious in my head to use power tools. Now, you could use power tools to section off from the mother load. I use a hammer drill. And then we put in uh, pin and feathers. I'll show you when we get outside. It's a, a pin and a couple of other pins that go in, in like so. And there's a holes drilled and you put the I have pins for every hole and feathers it's called pin and feathers just another pins and then I give everybody a chance to go along and pound on the pin and then it calves off like it was a glacier um, and so it's a pretty good party thing <laughs> You know, and then it's all over. <laughs> the last several little parties I had where I had a stone that needed to be cut you know, off the mother load, I set it up so the people at the party could come in and do that. No, I didn't have to. <laughs> and that sounds like a total blast for other people. <laughs> oh, yes, it, it was. Oh, my God. No, cheers! Oh, my God. Yeah. So, career Marvel, thank you. Fantastic. You covered a bunch of questions I had. Oh, oh really? Yeah, about tools and materials and... Well, I'm sure you'll have more. Oh, yeah. What's the appeal of stone sculpting specifically for you among all the media that you're skilled at? Uh. I'm one of few people to do it. So there's a certain thing about that. Um, I can express myself and, and have a good time doing it. And of course that expression deals with the history, our history. Uh, and in certain ways I can tie it all together. Depends on what rock we're looking at. Uh, but on the other hand, carving a stone is just fun. So I have uh, things that like pretend things that go on a Roman column. Or, you know, I'll just make up something in my own head. That might have happened. Uh, a caryatid. A caryatid. Oh, you, the big women yeah. of Roman... Roman mythology, Greek. Uh, I think we're talking Greek. Um, but I have a piece in, I, I think it's at the gallery, it's called Caryatid to Please. And it's one of those women, and there's a snake coming down, and you know, it's just fun to go and put these various things together and move on to the next one. It's about the next piece. It's a big 
this speaks to the mythological elements in his work. Very exciting. Mythological or mysterious? Both. I always wonder, what's going on here? <laughs> Does he have health? <laughs> How is your mature work different from your early work? Well, this is sad, because it's not. Go back to 2006, when I was drawing at the Yam, when Joe, I don't know his last name, was running the, the figure drawing on Thursday nights. Mm -hmm. The Black Hand group. Yeah, the Black Hand group that he started, I mean, probably 23 years ago, I think he said. And so in 2006, which wasn't 23 years ago, my work there, doesn't look much different than the work I did yesterday. Uh, uh, I don't think there's much difference. Uh, and I look at it and I say, you don't show any maturity at all. But I'm really happy with what I'm producing. So I continue. And there's plenty of uh, portfolios for you to look at. You know, I have a couple over there and there's three at the gallery. You can see all, all of those nudes. They're all produced over a, like a five-year period. Every Sunday, uh, El Camino College, we have the art department. We meaning a, a whole group of people, probably 45 or 50 people. And the reason I have so many of those is because we did this every Sunday from 10 in the morning till 5 at night. I think its cost was like 5 or 6 bucks. It was very cheap. The models got paid union scale, took breaks when they needed, so it was really nice. So 10 to 5, we had a slow, medium, and fast pose. So in one minute, you know, you, you couldn't, after you're doing fast sketches, you could move over to medium pose and a, a long pose, somebody was sitting all day. I go, God, just turn out the work, turn it out, turn it out. There's so many colors. But pounding it out. They tend to look, if they're good, like the one before. I'm not searching, I'm just applying. It's about application. <coughs> so applying your, your skills and, and what you feel about the history of the world or art, stone carving in the past or whatever, you're taking that to the rock. And the rock better conform. Around. Make wallboard out of it. <laughs> One thing I'm super curious about is that on your website you state that drawing is paramount. How does drawing inform and enhance sculpture? Uh, it's the drawing is has a number of things going on in it that apply and they don't apply. So you're, you're drawing on a flat surface. You've got a flat surface uh, and you're not trying to fool the eye. You're not trying to do Trump Royal, which is, you know, to fool the eye, but this is actually a face and it's got perspective. 3D. Uh, when you're drawing, I don't know the 3D is so much important at the time you're drawing. It's, and it might not have um, any, anything to do with, as a model, if you're using it, to work from. It's, there's just things in here that just don't make sense. You can't put your finger on, but the, what's the question again? The uh, meaning I, of drawing is paramount. The meaning of drawing is paramount, yeah. Well, Let's go back to the Paramount part. Not Paramount Studios, but Paramount in the sense of putting pencil or some instrument uh, and drawing uh, is the spearhead of, of your creativity. Not the spirit of humanity, but just creativity, I think. 
but then I meet people who can't draw and they really don't do art. Or they think that they can't draw a straight line of the ruler. We don't really deal with straight lines. So there's people who want to do art and they find a way and it comes to them and it comes to them and they have to exude that pressure. It is a pressure to push out this baby that you've got going on in your head. And I know I don't know what kind of baby these things are going to turn out to be, but I, I suppose it would be easier to say I am seduced by the curve, the seduction of the curve. You can make a lot of curves in, in, sand, in uh, marble. Every which way. Maybe when we go out to the studio gallery, you could show us a little bit or a, a tool that you would use for that and explain a little about it. Well, oh, yeah, I can do better. <clears throat> I knew it. Cool. Mm. Oh, how do you purposefully work toward your goal, uh, your stated goal of being an absolute relativist and a metaphysical naturalist? <laughs> well, you went digging for some stuff, Lisa. <laughs> metaphysical naturalist means, from birth, I'm an atheist. That's what a metaphysical naturalist is. And what was the other term? Uh, Absolute relativist. Yeah, yeah. so it's, <laughs> it's all about the here and now. And how I take the history and work it into now. And there's a lot of opportunities to, to pull those uh, conventions, if you will, or different things from the past you can throw into your work. It makes it look like you know you were talking about. Different things from the past. Um, you mentioned art history, or do you mean your past? Things you have created in the past? Uh, no, uh, it's about art history. Okay. So, so if you're interested in being an artist, there's two things you should do. One, don't join college. Don't go to college to be an artist. Drawing is paramount. And. Uh, there's another word I missed in there. Uh, drawing is paramount. What was the other stuff? Maybe study art history? Oh, yes, art history. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Study art history, and you can do that at our library. <coughs> read about Michelangelo and read about Van Gogh. Read about Van Gogh and read about Van Gogh. Um, and, and just look at Van Gogh. Um, and the rest of the history uh, is there, too, though. Those are the things that really, I think, a person, if they're going to be an artist, should look at first. Drawing okay. and artist. Oh, absolutely. So let's move now to a little studio and gallery um, where we will see a fascinating thing. He's going to tell us about the process of hammer drilling his one of his pieces in half. <laughs> yeah, that'll be fun. Here we are in Stone Sculptor Will Crane's studio and gallery. He's going to describe a little bit about the process of hammer drilling one of his own fabulous pieces into more than one piece. Um, <laughs> what it was like. So I, all I did was create more um, raw material for myself, but it's not raw material. It's got my footprints all over it. So where am I going to go with it? How, how am I going to make it different and still maintain some continuity with the other half? And I don't know how it's happening. Um, I'm chiseling away. And it's a surprise. I'm clueless. <laughs> and I carve stone. And where this piece is going, it's uh, organic shapes. Some are deeper than others. 
Uh, some have a base now, which they didn't before. Uh, another thing was that all of that stone that I cut in half was polished. There wasn't hardly any rough stone at all, except the very bottom. And, and so it, it was missing texture. So now I got a lot of texture to play with. <laughs> um, I'm not so sure that I really want it to be anything. It, it might look like a pile of white, uh, what's the word, opal. You know the word opal? Yes. It might look, look like that, but I just don't know where this is going. And surprises are good usually or hopefully so let's go back to the beginning of uh, carving you have to be conscious safety conscious or you're going to end up blind with a marble piece in your eye or in your ears and they're really hard to get out of your ears and they're oh, not. Wow. so i always wear my headset i love the music i listen to and uh, i wear goggles all the time so you want to watch yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> I don't think I can put this on over that. I need somebody to do my hair, makeup, and wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> I spent many years in Hollywood with all kinds of actors and actresses. And they all had hair, makeup, and wardrobe, you know, wardrobe to do stuff. Ah, uh, now we're good. Get these out of the way. They don't have to turn on the propane today. We have all kinds of different hammers. Right now, I'm really at this really small hammer stage. I'm uh, doing just really uh, light work, just moving so, some small areas back. I don't know where they're going to, how deep they're going to go. They might go a lot deeper. Uh, it's, it's not easy for you to see these chisels right now, but this is a very small carbide tip chisel. Most of my tools are carbide chip. Um, this piece here is carbide and it, it cuts through marble pretty easily. I do use um, the straight steel uh, as well, but the carbide there, I don't know how people carve without it. And you can certainly think about Michelangelo and his carving, and he didn't have carbide tip tools. How did this happen? They must have had a lot of guys running from the guy who makes the chisel to, to the sharpener, to somebody sharpen the chisel. And this, somehow it had to happen. I mean, he had, he spent five years carving the David. He had to use more than one chisel. So, and, um, you start off with a pointing chisel most of the time when you're beginning the work. And so I'm way past that stage. I don't even know where my pointers are. But after the pointing goes, we get to ones like that that are carbide tip. So you point the, the rock and you move off some of the big stuff. You come back with bigger hammer and you can move some rock. And you carve on this particular part until you think, well, you know, that I like how deep that is. I want it a little deeper. I want to leave some um, track, some, some uh, visual textile, technical stuff, technical stuff, texture, texture stuff. It's about the texture. And uh, with this, Carrera marble, you can have su such different textures, and then you can have it smooth as glass, and you can shave in it. 
And you shouldn't be holding your chisel like I was doing. You hold your chisel with your thumb above so that when you strike it and you miss it, you don't hit your thumb. <laughs> so you learn after a while, ow, and not ow. Um, on this particular piece, I was really getting fine. I started out with that. And I was using really small rounds like this. And, and, and the different size of the chisel and the different weight of the chisel and the, and, uh, tells you where you want to be, more or less. Uh, for instance, you wouldn't use a, a big hammer like this with this tiny piece here because it's just not... You're, you're using a small tool. You don't need to do that big heavy hammer thing. I mean, you can still hit it, but you're working the uh, the chisel, and it you know you can turn it however you want it, and, and the chisel gives you a lot of direction what you're going to be doing, and uh, and depending on where, what you want to do. If you want to cut away a lot of stuff, you wouldn't be using this. You're going to be using your pointer and uh, move some stone. I don't know how far I want to go with this. I, I kind of like an almost face because already I don't know where this is going. So if I put a real face on there and it's got two eyes, nose in between, mouth below, Alice in Wonderland, um, it's going to set up the stone so that there's a, uh, a self-referencing. So my work is full of self-referencing and it's, it's easy to do one shape references another shape and th th those shapes might be you know something from ancient history or from my history um, so self-referencing is really an important factor in in my artwork no, I so do I keep get, going I get what you're saying about that oh, self-referencing I, I could hear you it's like um themes in literature makes it more everything yeah mm -hmm. well thank you so much for your time oh really. wow thank you it's lisa wow wow yeah we did it we did it very cool <laughs>